Okay, hello and welcome to the Journalism and Media Studies Center here in Hong Kong from wherever in the world you may be. Uh, we've got people signed up from literally across the world, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you might be. And we really hope you've enjoyed those videos that we showed you because um, they give you an idea of the kind of students we have and the sort of work they do. They have a lot of fun, but they really work hard as well, as you saw from those videos uh, from our student interns in uh, Burma and in Nepal. Okay, before I go any further, can everybody hear me and see me? Type yes if you can do that. Wonderful. Yes, 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 they're all coming. Okay, um, my name is Thomas Abraham. I am the director of the Master of Journalism program here at the um, Journalism and Media Studies Center at the University of Hong Kong. And though I am the only one in front of the camera, uh, many of my colleagues and our staff are um, in the next room uh, chatting with you and making sure that everything uh, goes smoothly. So I'd like to take a minute right now uh, to get all my colleagues to say hello to you and to introduce themselves. Jason, there's Kevin. James, our communication manager, who looks after our Facebook page, which many of you have been attending. Yes, Hoon, our web producer and teaching assistant. So those of you who take the uh, digital tools course, um, he helps our students in that course. And we have a couple of our former students as well, uh, three of them actually. So uh, come on guys, say hello. Okay, we have a couple more who are still typing, and I think there's a slight lag as well. So um, while they say hello, I'm going to uh, keep talking um, and explain to you uh, what we are going to do. Now, I'm going to talk for perhaps about 20 minutes or so, um, introduce our program to you, um, and um, then I will stop talking. And if I don't stop talking, all my colleagues in the next room will make sure that I stop talking and I don't keep going on and on and on. And, and that will give you time to ask me questions. But in the meanwhile, keep asking questions, even as I'm speaking, and uh, we have people who will be able to answer um, your questions. So we hope to keep this a really informal, very sort of free-flowing discussion um, where everybody can talk to each other using um, the chat function. And I hope, um, I think we'll spend maybe about an hour um, in all, and uh, after which all of you can go back um, to, to enjoying uh, your weekends. Um, the picture that you can see on your screen is of Elliot Hall. Uh, and this is our home at the Hong Kong U campus. Uh, it's one of the older buildings, and we're really very fortunate. It's a historic building. We're very fortunate to have it. And this is where uh, the Journalism and Media Studies Center is headquartered. It's where we have our, our teaching. Most of our teaching happens here, our media labs, our conference room from where I'm speaking at the moment. And it's a lovely building. And it's a, it's a, it's a building that both our students and our teachers enjoy. Um, very greatly. Um, I think I will begin, I think one way to really introduce who we are and what we do is, 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 is to um, introduce myself first, because I'm really typical of uh, many of my colleagues, all my colleagues actually, who teach here. Um, I was a journalist for more than 25 years before becoming a teacher and a professor of journalism. 
Uh, my last job was here in Hong Kong as editor-in-chief of the South China Morning Post, which is the main English language newspaper here. Um, before that, for about 25 years or so, I was um, a foreign correspondent with one of India's big newspapers. Um, it was called The Hindu. And I was based with them um, in London, in Geneva, Switzerland, and in Sri Lanka. And during that period, it was my privilege really to be a witness to history to report on wars, on peace talks, on negotiations, to interview presidents, prime ministers, and to be able to write about big events that were affecting the world. And many of my colleagues, all my colleagues in fact, and you can, are exactly, we have the same kind of background. We are professional journalists, we love our profession, and our sole motivation now is to help others to do what we did, to become witnesses to history. So if that is what motivates you, then I think I would really strongly encourage you to look at our program, to apply to us, and learn a little bit more um, about us. Um, now let me actually tell you a little bit, not so much about me, but about our program itself. Um, there are other journalism schools in Hong Kong, in the region, across the world, but here are a couple of things that I think make us different. Um, we were started in 1999, and we had our first batch, and we, our vision, we were founded with a vision and our vision was to tell Asia's story to the rest of the world. Another thing that makes us different from other journalism schools is that we focus on journalism. We don't teach advertising, we don't teach public relations, we don't teach other forms of communication, and there are other universities that do that, and they do that very well. Our focus, our speciality is journalism. And the people who teach you are professional journalists, and our aim really is to turn out professional journalists. The other thing I think which distinguishes us is that we have a really international student body, uh, we have an international faculty, and we have, I believe, a world-class program in one of the world's top universities. So these are the three or four, uh, I think these are the three main features that distinguish us from other journalism schools. Now about the master's program itself. Now every year we take between 60 to 80 students. Um, we receive about six to 700 applications from across the world, so it's, it's, it's pretty competitive. Um, this is a one-year full-time or a two-year part-time program. Uh, we have 10 full-time faculty, and we also have 10 to 12 adjuncts and visiting professors. And these adjuncts typically tend to be senior journalists who are working in news organizations in Hong Kong at places like um, the New York Times, who come once a week or so to teach our students. And we have a large and excellent teaching support staff without which it would be really hard um, you know, for, for, for students to learn and for, for, for teaching to proceed smoothly. Our faculty, as I had said earlier, consists of entirely of professional journalists who have worked at the world's major news organizations. So we are not teaching you out of books. We're not reading textbooks and then repeating what textbooks uh, say to you. We are teaching you what we have practiced over decades. And we are teaching you the best practice as it exists 
in the best news organizations across the world. And um, this is from our JMSC uh, website. Um, and you can, um, I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you um, in your own time to go to the website, learn a little bit more about our faculty and about the people who would teach you. Uh, these are some of our adjuncts. Um, a little bit about our student body. Um, I'd say this is a fairly diverse international student body and this is the, oh, I'm sorry, we seem to have a little bit of a glitch because some of the, okay, I will come back to this. Um, but roughly, let me tell you, uh, we took in students from last year, 19 different countries. Um, about one third of them had already worked, had some working experience. Uh, some of them were journalists, some were not journalists. We take people from across the different professions. We've had people who've been working in bankers, we've had computer scientists, we've had teachers, we've had lawyers, we've had people who worked at something for about five years and, you know, and said that, you know, this is not for me. I want to be a journalist. So what our program really is, is a conversion program, which will turn whatever you may have studied earlier, this is the way we will help you, we will give you the tools to become a professional journalist within a year. Um, about a one third, so about one third of our students really have had prior experience, some in journalism, some in other professions. So whatever you're doing right now, whatever you have studied, if you are passionate about journalism, don't worry that you've had no experience or you've never studied journalism before. Then another one third or less than one third, maybe about 20% uh, uh, um, have our fresh graduates who have studied journalism. Um, and so this is really is, is, is the background of, of our students. I'm sorry you can't see the actual slides. Um, this was a slide which was going to show you, uh, because all of you want to know, all right, all this is great. What happens to our students um, once they graduate? Do they get jobs? What happens to them? Now, our most recent class, the class of uh, 2015, um, roughly 30 to 40 percent of them are already working in media related jobs. And we have another three to four percent who are working as freelance journalists. We have roughly 20 to 25 percent who are doing other things. Some have gone into research, some have gone into public relations, some have started their own business, a variety of things. And we have about 10 to 15% whom we have not, we're not quite sure what they're doing yet because they graduated, um, well, just less than a year ago. So, but the bottom line is about 35 to 40% are already have jobs in, um, you know, in journalism, in big news organizations. If you come here, what is it that you're going to learn? So let me take you through the uh, program structure. Now, as I had said earlier, the MJ program, it's a one-year full-time or a two-year part-time uh, study. Uh, you will require 30 credits to graduate, and this is the equivalent of 10 courses. So all of you need to take 10 courses in the course of one year or two years, of which four are compulsory and six are elective. So what are your compulsory courses? Um, these compulsory courses really are the core, what we believe to be the foundation of any journalist knowledge. That is reporting and writing, digital journalism, tools and principles, video news production, and media law and ethics. Because unless you know, unless you know the legal framework and the ethical framework within which journalists operate, it's really hard for you to know what to do with the tools that we teach you. So this is the foundation of your journalism education. And you would expect to complete, most of you would complete these core courses within the first semester of your study. 
Once that is done, we have a number of specialist courses where you would learn to use these tools to report on specific areas. For example, business and financial journalism, um, arts and cultural journalism, uh, reporting China, reporting health, reporting science. Um, and in addition, we have some additional uh, tools courses on things like data journalism, which is increasingly important today, on photojournalism, on feature writing for those of you who, who, who see yourselves as writers. Uh, we have courses on, you know, for those who want to uh, concentrate on the written word. We have um, courses on documentary film for those of you who are primarily visual. Um, some of our students are interested in doing further research, so we have an elective course on media research. Um, we have courses on international news reporting, global affairs, so a variety of courses depending on what your interests are. And as you can see, um, this is a pretty busy, it's an intense program because we pack a lot into these nine months. Right? So people are really busy, you learn a lot, but I think it's, it's a very, very, because it's intense, it's also an extremely fulfilling um, experience. And when you've completed, you really feel that you have achieved something. And you have achieved something. One of the features of our program is its internship program. Um, we have a full-time internship coordinator, Kevin Lau, whom some of you have already been chatting with. And every December, that is between our first and our second semesters, um, those students who wish to do internships, we put them in touch with media organizations across the region. And you have just seen videos produced for some of our interns who have just returned from um, their internships. Um, so, and they spend four to six weeks in media organizations across the region, as well as in Hong Kong, as well as in China, working in newsrooms and learning about and practicing the skills that they have tried, that they have learned over the previous, um, the previous semester. Now, the photograph you, you see here is of uh, one of our students uh, from Holland, Shari Neiman. She was here, I think, about three or four years ago. And um, she had gone to uh, the Jakarta Post, and she came back and told us about some of the stories she did in the newspaper. And there you can see her holding up a copy of um, the newspaper. Um, this is one of our current stu uh, students who is on an internship in Myanmar, in Burma, and you saw some of the clips and some of the work uh, that he has been producing. So this is to give you an idea about our internship program. Where do our students go on to get jobs? Now, over the years, we have our students now work in every major news organization across the world. And here's a list of some of the stu uh, places where our students are working. Um, international organizations like AP, and Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, um, local news organizations like the South China Morning Post, um, and TBB, um, China Daily, um, Yajo Jokan, um, in, 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 and, um, and a variety of, of, of other news organizations. And um, our program is roughly 15 years old. So what we're finding now is that our earlier students now are rising up to more and more senior uh, positions in their news organizations. And very often they're able to help us. They offer jobs to other, um, you know, to, 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 to fresh graduates, internships, and, and, and so on and, and, and so forth. I think one of the other great advantages that we try and give our students is an opportunity to meet leading figures in the industry. Um, and since we are all 
professional journalists. Um, we have relationships with journalists, prominent journalists working in other news organizations, and we invite them to come and speak to our students. Uh, the photograph you see there is of Christy Lou Stout, the um, CNN anchor, whom some of you may be uh, familiar with. She was here earlier this semester to, to talk to, to our students. Um, this is a photograph um, taken, I think, three years ago of, of, of Masood Husseini, who is an Afghan photographer um, who won a Pulitzer. He worked for the uh, French news agency, Agence France Presse, and he won a Pulitzer while working for them as a photojournalist. And he came shortly after winning the, um, um, the Pulitzer uh, he was passing through Hong Kong and he came and spoke to our MJ students and he, you, you can see they're all surrounding him and trying to get more out of him. Um, and this, by the way, is the photograph that he won his prize for. And just take a look at this. I mean, it, it really shows you both the power of journalism and the power of photojournalism. And this was taken just minutes after a bomb went off outside a... Uh, a mosque in Afghanistan. It was a suicide bomber. The bomb has just gone off. And you can see the little girl in front of you wearing green. Her entire family who was around her have been injured or killed. And you can look at the shock and the horror of, of, of what happens to her. And this is really what we mean by being a witness to history. And this really is what a journalist does. Okay, all of you are smart, and the next question that you'll be asking me is, what does all of this cost? Now, for local students, uh, the cost of a, a master's program is between $131,400 to $157,680, and this depends on how many units you take. The minimum number of credits you require is 30. If you take the minimum number, 131,000 is what you will pay. If you take more, you will pay more. And for overseas students, it is between 19,000 US to about 23,000, uh, 24,000 US. So that's how, how much um, what tuition uh, would cost you. And and I know it's really hard. I mean, it's, it, it's not easy for everybody to, to be able to sort of put this kind of money up front, but I think the best way really to look at this is to look at it as an investment in your future. And if you do this, you do well in the program, you get a job, you should be able to make this back within six, seven, eight months of working. So, um, I mean, I, as an investment, I think it, it, it's well worth it. So here are the, some of the dates that it is useful to remember. Now, people have already begun applying, and the review of applications began on the 1st of December. The deadline for applications is the 31st of January. Um, we will hold a qualifying exam in February 2016, and um, this will be held, we will hold it in three cities in China for students in China and for our overseas students, we will um, do it online. Following the exam, uh, we will call you for interviews sometime in March. And once more, those of you who can come to Hong Kong, come here, those who are in Hong Kong. Otherwise, we hold interviews in uh, Beijing and in Shanghai. And for our international students, we um, interview them. Skype, and by the end of March 2016, uh, we will be able uh, to let you know whether you have got into the program. Um, and my final slide really is giving you ways to keep in touch with us. Um, I think most of you have already visited our website. Um, our Facebook page, we're also on Twitter, and this is our email address. And all of this, of course, once more, will be posted on our website. So this really is the best way for all of you to keep in touch. 
Um, I think that's enough of me talking right now. So let me open it up to all of you to, to, to ask questions. Um, and the way it will work is please type in your questions and I will answer them. Um, um, I, I, I will answer them. Um, and those are the questions I cannot answer. I will, I will, um, I will, um, my colleagues will answer them for you. All right, so let me just start with um, the first question, the question that just come now. Okay, ooh, they are coming now. All right, so uh, let me begin with uh, Tanvi Gupta. Questions on the part-time. One, uh, should I apply to both part-time? Whether you, okay, for those of you who are, dis who are wondering whether to apply part-time or full-time, uh, no, there's just one application and at the time of the interview and so on, we can, you know, we can discuss whether um, you want to study part-time or whether you want to study full-time. So it's just one application. Um, UY IP, what reference book would you recommend us to read for pre-preparation? Now, you know, journalism and this exam is not something that you need to study for, right? Uh, what do we look for? What do we look for? I think this is a good opportunity for me to talk about what are we looking for. We're looking for the people who have the qualities to be a good journalist. And what are those qualities? Quality number one is that you should be interested in the world around you. Because what does a journalist do? A journalist tells other people, the public, about what's happening around them, right? Um, so you need to be involved, interested in current affairs, you need to be following the news, and you really need to be interested in what's happening in the world around you. You need to be curious, because if you're not curious, you will have no interest in what's happening around you. You need to be persistent. Why do you need to be persistent? Because it's a hard job, really, trying to find out what is actually happening in the world, um, as opposed to what people are telling you what's happening, to dig down, find the truth. All of that requires persistence. And so these are some of the essential qualities of a journey. Coming back to the exam itself, you don't really need to prepare. Uh, it's not something you need to study for. Um, and these are really simple questions. One is to test your English language skills. The, and the other question is to find out whether you really have the kind of characteristics and the qualities that we take, think make a good journalist. All right? Okay. Now, if I'm missing some student, uh, some of these questions, because they're flowing quite, quite quickly, um, please, okay, somebody has asked, I want to know if all the applicants have to take the exam. Uh, most applicants will have to, and if you feel that you have enough experience and you don't need to take the exam, uh, then we will let you know. Um, well, this, this is, this is uh, really um, going quickly, so let me try and... Uh, okay, Dominic wants to know, what's the average age of the MJ students? The average age of most students would be th between the late 20s and early 30s. And um, I think our oldest students tend to be, we have students in their 50s as well. And these typically tend, very often they're working journalists um, who come back to school in order to get new skills. For example, if, if you're in your 50s, when you started journalism, you knew very little about digital journalism. And so people come back. Our youngest would be 23, 24, fresh out of university. So that's the, um, the, the age range. Okay, let me pick one more. Um, somebody wants uh, Wu, Wu Xiaoshu. Hi, I want to know the passing rate of the interview or exam. So roughly in a normal year, we get about, you know, five, six, seven hundred. We take about 80 out of that. So that would give you, you can do the math yourself. Uh, that will give you the passing, uh, the number of applicants uh, that we take in. So it's roughly um, one in ten, one in seven, eight, nine, ten, around um, that that um, that proportion. Okay, uh, Tamsin Bergman. Okay, this is a good question. Jobs are getting. All your questions are good. I'm just picking on one good question. Jobs are getting more and more scarce for journalists in North America. I'm gainfully employed in Canada, but have a deep desire to work in Asia. Can you be candid about the job market in Asia? How tough is it to get employed and rise in the ranks? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, now, our experience has been, if you do well in the program, our top students get employed very, very quickly, very often before they graduate. 
Having said which, it is a tough job market. And why is that? Because the newspaper industry is changing. Big newspaper companies, television companies, all of that, I mean, the digital revolution is disrupting all of that. And in the future, we are going to have to find, and we already see, new kinds of news organizations, new kinds of journalists who are setting up their own news organizations, online news organizations, and journalism in the future is going to be much more entrepreneurial. And so one of the things that we do is to prepare you for the new, the future of journalism. Uh, we, have teach, we have a course in, digi in, in digital entrepreneurship. How do you start your own news organization, right? Why work for a boss? Why work for somebody else? Three or four of you in this day and age, it's such an exciting, exciting time to be a journalist. In this day and age, three, four, five, six of you can get together, start your own organization, report stories, shoot video, distribute it to others, and people are doing this. The catch, of course, is nobody is quite sure how to make money out of this. And that is, I think, but even that, I think that is something that will be solved over the next five, ten years. So, so to come back. Um, and this has been a long answer to a short question. Yes, jobs are getting more scarce. Our top students here get employed easily. That's the top five to 10% of our graduating students tend to get employed either before they graduate or within weeks and months after that. The next year takes a little bit longer. And the less well you do, the longer it takes you to get a job, right? So the job market is tough, but for a good journalist, there's always opportunity. Everybody is looking for good journalists. Employers are looking for good journalists, right? Um, and so a lot of it really depends on you. It is a tough job market. But let me tell you, in Asia, if you're good, you can make it. Okay, let me get another one. Um, I heard that, okay, now these are all, um, okay folks, is anybody, okay, so there's a question on, 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 on scholarships. May I know about scholarships? And uh, Yeah. Now, um, in terms of scholarships, unfortunately, we offer a few, but we really don't have enough money to give all the people whom we would like to give to. So yes, once you're admitted, um, there is a separate, uh, there's a separate process, there are other forms that you will um, need to, 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 to fill out. And um, we will do our best, um, roughly maybe about 5% or 10% of our intake uh, we are able to give scholarships to. But step number one really is to apply to the program, get into the program, and then we will talk about um, scholarship to the program. Um, I have a question. I want to ask a bit about the focus of the program. Is the program mainly focused on Asian news, Asian news, or does it take into account international European news? All right. Now, we, we teach you to be a good journalist. We are based in Asia. So most of the people who come here are those who wish to work in Asia. We have European students who come here and then work news outlets in their home countries in Asia. Um, so we teach you to be a good journalist. We, by living here, you become aware of, and to be honest, what happens in Asia and what happens in China over the next 10 to 15 years is going to be, to my mind, the biggest story in the world. And a lot of our focus really is on helping people to be journalists here. But having said which, many of our graduates have gone back to their home countries and are working there as well. But to be honest, most people who come here, come all the way across from wherever you are, halfway across the world, who come to Hong Kong, are those who are pretty passionate about Asia and who want to report on Asia. I hope uh, that answers your question. 
Right. Um, any other questions? I'm curious, how do you define a good... Okay, let me take this one. I'm curious about how to define a good journalist. Um, that's really a good question. I don't think there's a textbook definition of what a good journalist is, right? Um, and to be honest, journalism is a profession um, in which a lot depends on your own values, the value of a journalist. And we're like other independent professions, a bit like doctors and so on, right? Um, a lot really depends on your own values. So it's up to you. I and mean, clearly all journalists, the fundamental of, of any journalism is to tell the truth. Right? So you need to be accurate, you need to be truthful, um, and you need to serve the public in this way. So that is the bottom line. Beyond that, a lot really depends upon your own. What are the things, I mean, it really depends on why you think journalism is important. Um, what motivates you? Is your main motivation to be a journalist, to, 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 to for example, talk about the problems of, of, you know, we live in a very rich world, but we have many, many poor people, right? Uh, some people feel that, you know, they want to be journalists because they want to focus on this particular issue issue of inequality. There are others who feel that they want to be journalists because they want to write about the environment. Uh, there are others who become journalists because they, 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 you know, they enjoy food and they want to write about food. They want to write about entertainment. They want to write about culture. They want to write about business. All of that is perfectly okay. You can be a journalist in any of these areas. But I think the bottom line in all of this all forms of journalism is that you need to tell the truth and you need to serve the public by letting the public know what is going on. Okay, let me take some more. Charmaine asks, can I know how many international media outlets are connected with this program? Charmaine, I'm not quite sure what you mean by media outlets. We don't have any uh, direct connections with media outlets. But we have partners who we have worked with across many years to take interns, for example. Um, and our internship program, every year we place between 40, 50, 60 students in different media organizations across the world. Uh, big international news organizations, small regional organizations. So we have a wide network of contacts. And our students also work now in every news organization, starting from the big international organizations like the New York Times and CNN, down to small new, um, local news organizations. So we have contacts with a variety of news organizations. Um, OK, let me take this. Okay, compared with journalism, this is uh, something I'd like to address. Compared with journalism in Hong Kong Baptist University and Chinese University, what are the advantages of Hong Kong University? Now, this is an excellent uh, question because it really goes back to why we are different from all of these are good programs. These are good universities. Uh, but each one of these programs is slightly different. It's got its own focus. Uh, Chinese University is a broader, it's a school of communications. Um, and they teach journalism as well, but their journalism is much more, it is not as international a program as ours is, and the same with the Baptist University program. Uh, I think what distinguishes us is that we really look to a wider international global audience. So our student body is much more diverse, our teaching faculty is much more diverse, and our teaching is entirely in English. So you do need an extremely high level of English language skills. So I think these are some of the reasons that uh, distinguishes us from the other university uh, programs. Uh, some of them are much more attached to the local Hong Kong media scene. Uh, some of them have got uh, you know, uh, very good links with the Chinese language media. 
Um, and, but our focus really is much more on the English language and on the international media. Okay. Um, right, and I, th I, I see that uh, Karen, uh, our, our former student, has said exactly the same thing. Um, okay, I think, I, I think uh, my colleagues are doing a great job in answering all, all your, your, your questions. And as and when I see something that is not being answered, I will pick it up. Okay, here's one uh, from Maria, which nobody's answering at the moment, I think. Do many MJ students also join student associations, um, um, organizations? Um, to be honest, it, uh, the MJ program is so busy that, I mean, many of them do participate widely in student life, and there's a lot going on in the university, and every form of club and organization to cater to every interest you can find there. Uh, MJ students, because it's such a short and intense program, uh, tend really to not have that much time. I know many of them, uh, I think they're sporting, and many of them are pretty sporty, so they play a lot of games and so on. Uh, but in, in terms of having a lot of time for outside student activities, there isn't that much. Uh, one of the things, of course, is that, you know, when we teach our classroom time, we, you will meet for each course, you will have three hours a week where you have face-to-face -face contact. That's when you have lectures and workshops and so on. But for every class, after those three hours of classroom contact, you'll need to go out and do practical work. So if you're doing reporting and writing, you'll be going out into Hong Kong, interviewing people, doing stories. If you're doing, if you're doing in the video class, you'll be going out, shooting video, coming back. Same thing with the documentary class. So um, you are going to be really busy. And actually, within nine months, we cram in what many other journalism schools take um, two years to do. And the reason our program is so intense is that for most people, especially people who've already been working or even for fresh graduates who are looking to you know, enter the job market, um, two years is a long time to spend studying. And uh, most of our students are really eager and anxious to finish their course, learn as intensely as possible, and then go out into the job market. Um, is there a lot of journalism writing uh, training within the program? Yes, reporting and writing is one of the core, the fundamentals of all journalism, right? Uh, even if you're a, 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 a you feel, you think you're a video journalist, even if you, if you see yourself primarily maybe as an anchor, you still need to write stories, right? So, and you still need to report stories. So reporting and writing is the basis on which all the other journalist skills are, 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 are built. And if you can't report, if you cannot write clearly, and if nobody understands what you have written, then I'm afraid it's pretty useless to the public because nobody can understand what you write. So to answer uh, Jandan's question, yes, there is a lot of emphasis on um, reporting. And, and, and writing. Dominic again, curious to know if there are more individual assignments or group projects. Now once more, this uh, varies from uh, class to class. Um, most classes will have perhaps one group project and a whole bunch of individual uh, projects. Uh, because the aim of all, I mean, the aim of every class really is, on the one hand, group projects are important because it helps you to work together in a team, and that's what you will do in a news organization, you work as a team. 
At the same time, each individual has to have good skills. So we work a lot on individual students, making sure everybody's skills are working up. And we also have group projects to help you to uh, work together uh, as a team. Um, okay, what do we have? Okay, Tanvi, would you say a strong, lucid writer would always be a good journalist? That was a good question. I think a, a good, strong writing is a foundation for journalists. But good, strong writers could also write fiction, they could write poetry, they could write prose, they could be creative writers. So strong writing is not enough. Journalism is strong writing plus something else. And what is that plus something else? That plus something else is a fidelity to the truth, right? We are writing non-fiction here. We use good writing or strong images, if you're a photojournalist, to illuminate current affairs. You can use strong writing as a creative writer. And that, in a sense, also is another way of looking at the world because good, non -f good fiction also, in a sense, illuminates the world. But the difference between journalism and other forms of good writing is that journalism is solely concerned with fact and with events that are happening around you. Um, are there any other questions that I can pick up? Hey, you guys in the back room, you're doing a great job. Okay, Wayip, how do you define literary journalism? This is an interesting question. Um, now, the term literary journalism is something, actually, it's a very American thing. Um, and in the UK, in other parts of the world, you don't have the whole idea of literary journalism. And um, literary journalism arose it's, as a genre or as a term in the United States, really, to describe journalists and writers who use some of the tools of creative writing to write about actual events. And these would be everything from you know, the use of metaphor, the use of you know, writing to convey a lot of atmosphere, to convey character. In a sense, to use writing, to, write a, to use the tools of fiction, in a sense, or creative writing to write about real world events and facts. And very often literary journalism, I mean, it's different in a sense from news reporting when you're reporting, when you're writing about events. Um, more literary forms of writing are, tend to be about longer issues, about deeper issues, um, and, and, and tend to be longer pieces as well, uh, in which there's place for you to do things like develop individual characters, and once more, the difference is that these are not characters that you are making up, but these are real life characters. But then you have more time to write about these characters. And you can make these characters come alive using some of the techniques that writers of fiction also use. So that, in a, in a, in a sort of nutshell, in a very sort of brief outline, um, uh, way, is what literary journalism is about. OK. Jai Yang. Hi, Professor. What is the most important quality of the applicant from your perspective? Um, the most important quality of the applicant really is, will you make a good journalist? And what are the qualities of the journalist is some of the things that I have been thinking of, uh, talking to you about. Um, an interest in the world outside you. A curiosity in the, um, in the world around you. Uh, the desire to understand how the world works, and the desire to explain this to other people. Right? So you need to be persistent, you need to be curio curious, you need to have a good mind, because we live in a complex world. And you need to have a mind which can understand these complexities and explain it to other people. At the same time, you need to be a good communicator, in the sense you need good writing skills, because otherwise nobody will understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, and you need to be communicate. You need really to have the ability to communicate complex realities to a public. So, in a nutshell, these are some of the qualities that we look for. Ah, Maria, good question. Who do you think will pay for quality journalism? You know, this is a question. 
Um, that we keep, I mean, these are one of the questions that we at the Journalism and Media Studies Center, these are some of the issues that we also think about. We don't just train journalists, we also do research. We think a lot about the future of journalism. We're trying to understand the future. Uh, we work a lot with, uh, you know, with uh, news organizations and others trying to understand the future. So coming back to your question, who do you think will pay for quality journalism? I think at the end of the day, the public will pay for quality journalism. If you think about it, um, one of the most profitable publications in the world is, guess what, The Economist, okay? Um, I think all of you are probably familiar with The Economist. It's a weekly magazine dealing with current affairs. Um, and they deal really with solid topics. Climate change, the war in Iraq, what's happening, all of these issues. Um, there's nothing, it's very well written, well argued, well analyzed, but there's nothing fluffy about it. You don't get gossip about film stars, right? And they make money. The general feeling is that people are only interested in light news, in gossip, in entertainment, and they won't pay for anything else. But I don't think that is right. At the end of the day, people pay for quality journalism. And you can see this even in places like the New York Times where they are beginning to make money out of subscriptions to their website, something that was free earlier. And those who appreciate the New York Times brand of journalism are increasingly saying, yes, we will pay for this. If you give members of the public quality products and whatever product it might be whether it's journalism whether it's a car whether it's a movie they will tend to pay for it unfortunately most big news organizations are too nervous they don't believe this they're saying oh people will never pay for it so we need to make our journalism cheap because we don't have enough money for quality um, and i think slowly the tide is turning and ultimately, it is the public that it will pay for journalism, provided the public believes that you are serving them. And that you're not serving advertisers, you're not serving other masters, but you are serving the public. And I think, uh, so this, I think, these are some of the changes that are happening as we speak in the media industry. Right, I find that I'm giving long lectures to each of your very short pointed questions. So I hope I'm actually, I'm enjoying talking. I hope I'm actually <laughs> answering your questions. Okay, we have about <clears throat> five minutes more. So are there any last questions? Um, let me see them. Okay, so let me go back. Okay, why if you are asking, in your opinion, what does big data mean to journalists, especially in the fast changing media landscape? Um, this is one of the big areas of journalism, that is data journalism. Increasingly, <clears throat> and this is really thanks to, 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 to technology, um, information technology and computers, everybody, whether it's journalists or members of the public, now are able to increasingly use large streams of data in order to gather meaning and to tell stories using data. Um, you can call this big data, you can call it small data, but this is a new source of stories in journalism. And journalists can use this really to do very creative investigative stories. Um, let me give you an example. Um, I live in Hong Kong, and in Hong Kong and in every, wherever you go, you have health data which tells you how many people are suffering from different diseases. We also have data which will tell you which are the richest parts of a city and which are the poorest parts of a city. Now suppose I have data on, say, the number of cases of lung cancer in a city, 
and this data is available in different geographical parts of the city. Now, what a data journalist can do is to take this data about, say, at any disease, lung cancer, for example, and then look at data also about people's incomes across the city and try and see, is there a relationship between income and lung cancer? Is it, for example, are poorer people getting lung cancer more than rich people? Right? And this is something you can just find out through data. And suppose we see that poor people uh, tend to be more prone to lung cancer than wealthier people. Then we can go look at the localities where poorer people live, and we can get data, for example, about sales of cigarettes, pollution, and put all these different sets of data together and see whether there is a relationship between the environment in which you live in and your risk of developing lung cancer. So these are some of the ways in which data can be used to tell stories. I'm sorry, these are really long answers. I feel I'm talking too much. Um, so, because we're almost, almost running out of time. Um, okay, let me take, uh, na, 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 how to balance. Okay, I'm going to take, I'm, go, I'm going to, oh, these are really good questions, lots of good questions. Um, okay, I'm going to take one, the most recent one that I can see. Uh, from your experience, do people with an outgoing personality make better journalists? This is a really, really good question. Um, and I don't know. You know, I think it's really hard to be shy and to be a good reporter. Um, why? Because being a reporter requires you to go out and talk to people. And for most people, me included, when I, this is the hardest thing to do, to go and talk to a stranger and ask them questions, to pick up a phone and talk to somebody whom you don't know and get them to talk back to you. Um, so you need the personality which is comfortable dealing with other human beings. Um, and I think that's really useful. Um, is this something, but not everybody is born with these qualities. I mean, some of us are outgoing, some of us are not. Some of us love being with other people. Some of us prefer to be on our own. Some of us feel that you know the best thing you can do is to hang out with your friends and have a meal. Others feel the best thing you can do is stay at home quietly and read a book. We're all different kinds of human beings. But as journalists, all of us, you can be taught whatever your personality is because you do need to go and talk to people. And so one of the skills that you learn, whether you're outgoing or not, is how do I go and talk to people? How do I get information out of people? How do I get people to talk to me? Right? So that, these are useful human skills. Um, to have. Um, okay, here's another question. That I'm gonna, how do faculty members who are no longer in newsroom stay abreast of the latest practices and trends in the industry? Um, because we teach through many ways. First of all, we always have people from newsrooms coming and talking to us. Secondly, those areas, those of us who have not worked in a newsroom tend to deal with areas that have not changed very much. Fundamentals of reporting and writing, for example. What makes a good story? How do you write a good story? Um, those of us who teach digital journalism are those who are much more involved in the industry as it is today. Right? So this is one way uh, that we, we, uh, we sort of keep in touch. Uh, we are helped by the fact that the basic principles of journalism have not changed, on the one hand. And for the changes, we have really good, we bring in people from industry. We do our own research, for example. Some of my colleagues are researchers in new media and the use of social media. So we do a lot of it as we do our own research, which in turn eventually will help the industry. Uh, there's really a good, there's this constant dynamic between what happens in universities and what happens in, 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 in university. For example, recently we hosted, with the help of Google, we hosted hack, a hack day here, and you can read about it on our website. We, we had teams of journalists come from different news organizations. They spent 48 hours here, and they developed a new news product. And we had experts from YouTube, from different
different organizations coming, speaking to them. So we, in a sense, we try to be very much part of all that is happening, part of the cutting edge of what is happening. Even though many of us, those of us who are my age um, and have got increasingly, the color of our hair is changing a lot over, has changed a lot over time. Um, we tend to teach those sort of slightly more timeless skills. And, but we keep abreast really by having people come, by hosting events, by having people from you know, technology companies come, do things with us by partnering with them. All right, so I think it's a little over 10 o'clock and um, I think we should, we should sort of let all of you return uh, to your weekends. And uh, maybe if there's one last question, um, I will take that. Otherwise, uh, please stay in touch with us through our website, through our email addresses, and you can keep asking us these questions. You can always email me as well. Um, you can email any of our faculty members with any questions that you have. We really are a very open, uh, uh, open, a uh, very sort of open group of people. We love talking to other people. That's why we're journalists. We love talking to other people. Um, so do stay in touch. And I um, thank you very much once again for spending some time with us and for taking enough interest in our program to learn a little bit more. And I hope some of you at least um, will be inspired to, um, to, you know, to, to, to apply to us and feel that you really want um, to be a journalist. So uh, with that, goodbye. Uh, good once more, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you may be. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.